right. Hello, and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, the Real Seeker, and I'm joined by my co-host, Tyler Fowler. Hey, Tyler, how's it going? Good, Dale. I'm good. I'm having a really good day so far. I'm excited to talk to Dr. Daryl Bach about the historical Jesus, brother. This is going to be a fun conversation, I got a feeling. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and obviously, we are joined by our guest that you just mentioned, Dr. Daryl Bach. Hey, Daryl, how's it going? Doing fine. How are you? I'm very well, very well. Yes. Excited to, to have you on board here. And um, yeah, I think uh, one thing, uh, obviously, as Tyler mentioned, we're going to be talking about the issue of cultural apologetics and how that relates to the historical Jesus. But just before we get into the topics, um, just for the audience, do you want to kind of introduce the audience as to who you are, your background, and if you don't mind, share a little bit about your own faith journey as well? Okay, well, um, I'm Daryl Bach. I've I've been, I'm senior research professor of New Testament studies here at Dallas Seminary. I've just completed my 41st year teaching here. And uh, I'm also um, executive director for cultural engagement at the Hendricks Center for Christian Leadership here at the Seminary. So I work in two areas. I work in mainly the Gospels and Acts in New Testament, historical Jesus areas, and then in cultural engagement for the seminary. Um, Okay, be, did not grow up in a Christian home, became a believer in college between my freshman and sophomore year, um, and then went directly to seminary uh, out of college, did three years in Aberdeen, have done four single years in Germany at Tübingen as a Humboldt scholar, which is a scholarship that uh, goes to the humanities and creates a relationship between the scholar and the school in, in their view for a lifetime. So that's that's the background. Um, happily married for 47 and almost 48 years. Um, three kids, five grandkids, and uh, and they're away on a family vacation, and I'm here doing this with you. So <laughs> <laughs> Nice. All right, cool. We thank you for your sacrifice. Yeah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, cool. So, so, yeah, I just want to get into kind of the first topic, and, and we're talking about cultural apologetics and that sort of thing. So, just in the first place, do you want to do you just want to take some time to kind of mention like what what is apologetics and what what is this new notion of cultural apologetics all about? Well, cultural apologetics, apologetics traditionally has been uh, the defense of the faith and the presentation of Christianity against objections. But cultural apologetics is also engaged in thinking through how do you interact with a culture, um, particularly a pluralistic culture in which we find ourselves in more and more. And, and with all the um, communication revolution, the tighter the world is connected, communicating, the more options that are out there, et cetera, it's harder to live in a bubble. And so cultural apologetics is about how to engage with that larger culture, not just defend Christianity, but thinking through what it is to engage with someone who's coming from a completely different place. Gotcha. Um, and do you think that there's a priority in terms of engaging in one versus the other? Or yeah, actually? Well, they're actually intertwined because um, to the extent that you're interacting with someone and, and they could be coming as opposed from maybe one or two different places in the way people used to interact in their cultural background, now they could be coming from anywhere. And that can be um, overwhelming to people, um, all the options, all the worldviews, you know, not just um, Judaism or Islam, but Eastern religions, put that in the mix, et cetera. I mean, um, the variety of forms of secularism, atheism, all the isms that are out there. I mean, by the time you're all done, you say, man, I'm going to go through a cafeteria and see what I, I say. The modern world is like a Middle Eastern bazaar. So it's like a big Middle Eastern mall. And there are lots of booze in the bazaar, and some of the booze are pretty bizarre. And so uh, in the midst of that, you've got this huge variety that you have to interact with. So how do you do that, and how do you do that well? That's that's the challenge of cultural apologetics. Gotcha. Yeah, I, th I think you kind of already answered my, my next question, but I'll, I'll just throw it to you anyways before I give it to, over to Tyler. But uh, one of, it's an objection that I've heard against cultural apologetics uh, from, I think, from an atheist. And... He was trying to say, like, well, look, by doing cultural apologetics, you're totally neglecting the individuals. The purpose of apologetics is to convince individuals and defend the faith uh, for them. So 
I don't know if you've heard any of those. That today. shows a total lack of understanding of the way cultural apologetics works, because part of cultural apologetics is saying my first responsibility is to get a spiritual GPS reading on where the other person is, which means asking them questions about how they see life, the way in which they put it together, et cetera. So you're actually getting an individualized map of how this person is putting uh, their world together, how they see the world, how they see their own identity, et cetera. And then you, and then you respond accordingly as opposed to going in with a blueprint that you just lay over the person no matter where they're coming from gotcha awesome yeah tyler uh, i'll just get your your quick uh take on cultural apologetics and then turn it over to you if you have questions for for daryl no i mean this is just this is my first time really hearing the terminology uh, of cultural apologetics i've studied apologetics uh for a little bit now i mean not not super long maybe uh, a hard study for the last year uh, but no, this is something that's brand new to me, Dale. Okay. Yeah, I think that traditionally cultural apologetics has been about what you know and what's in your head. And I tell people, well, really, the key to most engagement is not just what's going on in your head, but relationally what's happening mm -hmm. and how to connect relationally. And that that's where the culture comes in. That's where the formation of the person you're interacting with comes in. Apologetics has tended to focus on what I know, but what cultural apologetics is also focused on is where the other person is coming from and working on a conversation that is aware and knows how to engage with a person who's coming from a different place. So it's it's kind of a flip of the arrow of the, or the normal focus. Mm -hmm. um, you need both. And, uh, the, the, and this is a needed dimension because if you actually listen to most testimonies from people who did not grow up in the church, what they will say is, um, I met this person, I, I like to joke, I'm, I'm, I met so-and-so, but I don't mean it in the way we normally mean so-and-so. I met so-and-so, and they were just so different from what I was used to. I was curious about what made them tick, and that opened me up to what Christianity was all about, and then the rest of the testimony goes from there. But almost inevitably, when you meet someone who did not grow up in a Christian home, that element is in the testimony somewhere, and that shows a relational connection as being key as important as anything intellectually that's being offered to the person. Can I ask you a question real quick, Dr. Bach? Do you think the relational aspect is missing in a lot of, say, just online discussions whenever it comes yes. to apologetics? Yeah, well, the online is not built for the relational. I mean, just to put right. it simply. And so, yes, that is often what's made. Because what we do is we limit it to what we think is um, to what we think is right mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and keep the the discussion at a content level, and that's not where most conversations are 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 functioning. You build you build that relational space, especially with Christianity. Christianity is challenging people in terms of where they live and how they go about it, mm -hmm. and so um, uh, so so that challenge becomes uh, important in showing uh, that relational dimension and making that connection, because the challenge means person not going to care about how you challenge them unless they know you care. Yeah. And so um, that, that builds that step into the equation. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yep. So I, I love that saying, and it's something that our, our other co-host David, he says a lot. And I think that's, you know, it sounds like the relational aspect missing is what's leading to not very many successful. There seems to be a lot of uh, talking past each other whenever it comes to online discussion, especially. So exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah. One thing um, I'd like to ask you, and it actually will be relevant to me personally, because I, I will admit I, I suck at the relational aspect. I, I struggle with that myself. So do you have any kind of tips for, for people who aren't maybe extroverts or aren't good at that stuff? How can they engage in cultural? Just be a good listener. I mean, it's it's being a good listener. It's It's listening not to rebut but to actually understand and get to know the person where they're coming from and why they believe what they believe, that kind of thing. I tell people, you may not be able to master a hundred different worldviews or approaches to life, but you can ask a question about where a person is coming from and approach it from the standpoint of, my goal is to try and understand your whys and wherefores. I don't necessarily have to agree with those whys and wherefores, but I want to understand where you're coming from. And if you start there, what you're looking for are values that undergird what makes the person tick and how they put life together. And you're looking for values that that person may apply in a slightly different way than you do, but that are a basis for a conversation. And then, and then you go from there.
All right, cool. All right, cool. So um, I, I'm going to circle back to the cultural apologetics. But before we get to that, I want to switch gears to the, the issue of the historical Jesus in particular and uh, learn the facts and the intellectual stuff about that. So let's let's start out. OK, the historical Jesus. Um, who Who is that? And how do we know as historians or biblical scholars that there even was a historical Jesus? Because there are unfortunately, a lot of mythicists out there today. So, Well, there are a lot of mythicists out there that make a lot of noise, but most people who know anything about ancient history believe that Jesus certainly existed in it and that he was a figure who must have had some impact to generate something called the church. It didn't, you know, it, uh, it didn't, um, the, there's no such thing as the church ex nihilo, the church out of nothing. So, um, so, so, yeah, so and, and then we have testimony beyond Christians in first century about who Jesus was. Uh, Josephus, yep. Suetonius, Tacitus all refer to this figure in one way or another. And so um, most classical scholars will tell you that um, classical scholars don't have any doubt that Jesus existed. There can be a lot of discussion about you know, what he did and said and taught. And the historical Jesus discussion basically says, we can't always be sure about what the Bible is telling us, so let's pursue Jesus and what we can know about him. In, in the best, uh, neutral is probably not the right word, but in the best historically constructed way we can, while being somewhat skeptical about the way the Bible handles Jesus. So how do we get beyond that? And, uh it was founded in the latter part of the 18th century. It was founded by skeptics. But there, frankly, is a lot that can be learned in how to make arguments that don't depend strictly on an inspirational argument about the Bible in order to talk about who Jesus is. So conservatives have entered in on that basis and actually have ended up offering a lot. There have been traditionally discussed there are three phases of of historical Jesus discussion. That's probably an oversimplification, but in the first phase, it, it was separating out um, uh, on a naturalist worldview what we can know about Jesus. That's obviously flawed in light of some of the claims that the Bible makes. The second level emphasized the role of, um, of the way in which cultures interact with each other, Greek culture and Jewish culture, and argued you could distinguish the two and anything that reflected the Greco-Roman culture, which came after Jesus came out of uh, Israel, would be light. That uh, division doesn't work. The Dead Sea Scrolls showed that. So that died, it, although some of the second questers still exist. And the third quest said, the place to start with Jesus, understand him and his Jesus background. And that is still where historical Jesus work is done today, is in making sense out of the Jewish background of understanding uh, how that works. There's also been debate about how do you try and substantiate what's in the Bible. Um, multiple attestation where you get the same story told from two different angles, from two different sources. It's like the principle in journalism that says if you have two sources, you can print a story. Um, things like that sometimes get used, although that has become its own debate today as well. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I want to turn it to Tyler because you kind of, you mentioned some sources and that we have extra biblical sources, but a lot of skeptics are actually shocked to find out that, believe it or not, the new, even secularist Bart Ehrman, for goodness sakes, uh, the Gospels are our best sources. The New Testament is our best sources, even for secular historians. And Tyler, I know you're going to be doing working on a documentary down the line. Do, do you have any questions about the New Testament as a source for the historical Jesus for Daryl? Uh, not so much about the New Testament. I do have a question about so extra biblical literature. So I'm reading a book uh, by Lee Martin McDonald about the canon of scripture, his new edition of the formation of the uh, old and new Testament canon of scripture. And he was talking about in his uh, introduction about scholars, uh, mainly liberal scholars from like Jesus seminar, things like this, uh, that's wanting to add maybe quotes from say like the gospel of thomas into this data pool to kind of build this structure to to build more and try to identify the historical jesus more carefully or or more accurately uh in uh, dr mcdonald's 
uh, words. How would you react? Uh, what What do you say, Doctor Bach, about scholars wanting to pull from like the Gospel of Thomas to say, oh, "Well, I think this is a little more accurate than maybe what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote." Well, the God, first of all, you have to date the Gospel of Thomas, which is either going to be early second century. Some people put it in the middle of the second century, pretty late uh, down the road. Second thing you have to wrestle with is there are elements of the Gospel of Thomas that show a presence of what's called Gnostic Christianity. Mm -hmm. And Gnostic Christianity traditionally has been viewed as not emerging in a serious kind of way until the second century as well. So those influences tell you that those sources are late. They're not early. And they've been placed into the discussion because the Gospel of Thomas has a mixture of material, some of which is reflective of what you see in the Gospel tradition and some of which isn't. I tell people, if you read the Gospel of Thomas, you'll go, oh, some of this sounds like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And some of it does sound very much and reflects mm -hmm. the type of thing you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Another maybe... Maybe that's 25%. Another 25% goes, well, that sort of sounds like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then other 50%, you go, man, I have no idea where that's from. That doesn't sound like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at all. <laughs> yeah. So it is a mix, which is why it's fascinated scholars, because it clearly has one foot in, in what became the gospel tradition that we see in the gospels and another foot somewhere else. But that somewhere else is the story. And so, um, so that's why... It, it's helpful to have us see how Jesus was seen by some down the road, but it doesn't really put us that closely in touch with Jesus himself. Okay. So if somebody would appeal, like say we're engaging someone uh, that would appeal to these scholars, uh, is that how we would handle those kind of arguments? Yeah. Just yeah. I did a whole date? study on a okay. book called The Missing Gospels that walked through all that content, okay. talked about what the what the theology was, the variations of expression of theology were in all those sources beyond, mar, beyond the gospel of uh, Thomas, by the way. And then, and then compared that with the consistent story you get out of the first and second century, both the, both the gospels and the new Testament, but also the writings of the earliest church fathers whose mm -hmm. story about what Christianity is, is pretty consistent. Okay. And so that variation you can, you can trace. Um, I did it with relationship to four themes, uh, who God is in the creation, who Jesus is, Jesus's work and the nature of salvation and showed um, the differing, the differing perspectives that the missing gospels give us as opposed to what we see in the first two centuries of the early church. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Go ahead, Dale. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. So you've, we've kind of talked about the sources. I'm, I'm sure Tyler had no questions about the, the gospels and all that. Okay. Um, but uh, so let's look at the level of facts then, right? You, you know, Mike Lacona, you have facts and then you have method, but let's look at the facts. Um, so bracketing out Jesus' death and resurrection, um, what can we know about Jesus historically from the sources in terms of his, his life? Now you mean, do you mean the ex biblical source? Cause that, obviously makes a difference how I answer the question. Um, well, let, okay, let's let's answer from both. Uh, okay. What do we have from the gospel? So let's start with the extra biblical sources. And from the citation we have from Josephus, we know that Jesus was a worker of um, surprising deeds, what are called, uh, the Greek word there is paradoxon, and we get, the idea, we get the idea of a paradox from that term, but it's basically unusual deeds. That tells us he had a reputation as a miracle worker, as doing things that other people weren't doing. Um, we know that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. We know that the early church believed that he was raised from the dead. So the, what we might call the most basic core outline of Jesus, except for the Christological beliefs, are present in Josephus. If we go to the letters of Pliny the Younger to Trajan, the emperor Trajan in the early second century, we know that the early church is worshiping Jesus as a god. That we're told... Uh, that were told by the text, um, by the letter, and and uh, in fact, the letter works like this. I'm told that Christians who will who will bow down to Caesar and deny that Jesus is divine, I can give them clemency. But if they won't do that, then I'll punish them. And he asked the emperor, "Is this the right way to go when dealing with this?" And emperor basically says, "Yep, that's a good policy." So, so we have that. Um, 
And really, Suetonius and Josephus tell us much the same thing in terms of um, this movement came from a figure who was the Christ who was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So the most basic outline of how Jesus came to die and how the church emerged is in multiple uh, non-biblical sources. The biblical sources, of course, tell us Jesus did have this ministry of miraculous activity. They also obviously stress the uniqueness of what Jesus is and how he got into trouble with the Jewish leadership, which explains why, how is it that he ended up on a cross? How is it that a Galilean, how can I say this, that an average Galilean religious teacher ended up on a cross for sedition, mm -hmm. which is he was crucified for sedition by Rome? And the Gospels tell that story. He got in trouble with the Jewish leadership. The Jewish leadership thought he was disruptive of the people. There was a messianic claim. This is very important. There was a messianic claim, which was a claim to be king. Rome appoints the kings of the Roman Empire, you know, yeah. uh, and they believed in law and order. You follow our law, we'll put you in order. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that order meant crucifixion if you claim to be a king who, who Rome didn't appoint. So all that fits, it's congruent with what we see um, in the Gospels to explain how we get to Jesus' death. Okay. Um, so uh, before I bring in Tyler, just uh, one or two more question, quick questions about Jesus' life. Bra bracketing out his death and resurrection part, because I'm going to ask about that next as the main category. But okay. I'm interested in Jesus' other miracles. So you, you mentioned it is a historical datum that he was known as a miracle worker and an exorcist and an exorcist. I don't know if you mentioned that. Yeah. Part. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, what about specific miracle accounts? Like I know people like Graham uh, 12 tree have argued for the historicity of like 22 or something. Do, do you think we can actually prove historically specific miracle accounts at all? Or? Uh, well, I think the word proof here is tricky because if a person doesn't have a category that allows for miracles, you're not going to be able to prove anything. Okay. Uh, but you can certainly make the case that the most likely explanation for the combination of things that you're doing is this is the explanation for what took place. This is why people came to believe it. You know, you got to ask yourself, what would cause a Jewish person who believes in one God to embrace a human being as someone who's a part of the Godhead? What in the world will take you there? Mm -hmm. um, and something's got to do it that, that reflects the pressure of, of a set of activities and beliefs that would push someone in that direction. And the Gospels do tell that story. I mean, when Jesus calms the winds and the waves, the line at the end of the passage, who calms the winds and the waves that they obey him? And they've got the Psalms in the background where God's the one who's in control of creation, that kind of thing. Um, when Jesus forgives sins, as he does with the paralytic, um, and he asks the question, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk, he ties something you can't see, you can't see forgiveness of sins, to something you can see. Mm -hmm. And so when the guy gets up and walks, he says, in order that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, get up and walk. So when the paralytic gets up and walks, he isn't just walking, he's testifying to the fact that God has shown that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. And so you've got those kinds of things. You've got the healing on the Sabbath in John 9, where the blind man basically says, you know, um, God isn't supposed to help someone who's a sinner who's violating the Sabbath. So how'd this happen? And how'd this happen in this way? So those are all designed to push against kind of what I call the glass ceiling of Christology and have people see from the earth up who Jesus is and to crash through that glass ceiling and say, he must be tied to heaven in one way or another. Gotcha. That, so you kind of answered my, my second question a little bit because I, I was going to ask about the earliest Christology and how you think that kind of developed, like, you know, obviously what was Peter right from the beginning? Yep. We've got the full Trinity, the Nicene Creed in my head, or is there a process of development or yeah. How do you see that as well? No, I think, I, I think it emerged from the life and ministry of Jesus and they were dealing with that. I'm, I'm going to warn you, they're doing some construction in the building here. So you may be hearing some noises in the background. I, I hear them. I hear them waking up. So I'm nervous about no. how noisy it's going to get. No problem. No problem. We're, we're flexible. So okay. yeah, I see Tyler here. He's, he's anxious to go. So yeah, over to you. Do you have any questions related to the, 
I just have to say, Dale, I love this topic. I I, I really do. So I, I do have a couple questions. So I'm not sure uh, you probably are, but uh, are you familiar with Dr. Alan Segal's work on the two powers in heaven? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Does that give the background for the disciples understanding exactly who Jesus is? I'm sure he explains it to him, you know, in more detail. We get that in the Gospels. But does that concept that, that Dr. Segal really did a good job, I think, you know, showing that this concept is in first century Judaism. Is that really what lays the background for the disciples to be able to accept that Jesus is God in the flesh? Yeah, there's a little bit of uh, that, that certainly it, what it does is it opens up the possibility of thinking that way. OK, and so that's what you're seeing is the possibility of um, of of um, Jesus being thought of as this second power in heaven who's existing God in the things that need to be done in order to save and deliver people. The picture of the Son of Man in Enoch is one example of that figure. And of mm -hmm. course, Son of Man is Jesus' favorite name for himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get that concept, the Son of Man figure, really in Daniel. And from my surprise, in First Enoch, like you just said, I think the two really go hand in hand. Uh, whenever you uh, whenever you you take all of Second Temple Judaism as a bigger picture and say these were the texts that were kind of influencing, you know, Jesus and the disciples at the time. Um, but my second question is, so going back to texts like Josephus, I've heard and this is this accusation has kind of been been brought up to me a f more than a few times uh, over the past. I'm going to say year now. But what do we do? whenever somebody so kind of going back to the cultural apologetic thing what do we what's our answer for if somebody asks us about or or just demands that these these writings about jesus say in josephus tacitus pliny they're just christian interpret uh, interpolations that stemmed later on down the road how, how do we deal with that well exactly? in the josephus citation there is a side remark coming a couple of chapters later Mm -hmm. about James being killed, who was the half-brother of the Lord, a mm -hmm. half-brother of the, of the so-called Christ. Mm -hmm. That remark makes absolutely no sense unless he's talked about who Jesus claiming to be the Christ is. Right. So, so one passage refracts back on the other and tells you something. Josephus said something about this earlier. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that's not... There are Christian interpolations in the version of Josephus that we have. The outright confession that he was the Messiah, sure. the idea that um, that he was he was raised from the dead, and that and that, that ten thousand people believe this. You know, that there there are remarks in that citation that you can identify clearly identify as as Christian interpolations. But most classical scholars will argue that the core of what is said that is not clearly Christian from perspective but descriptive mm -hmm. is a reflection of who Jesus is. Josephus says three things. It introduces Jesus as a man, and then the interpolation says, if it's wise to call him a man, in other words, the suggestion that he could be something more, the confession that he's a Christ, and then this kind of praise thing that emerges as the discussing um, the claim of resurrection or the claim of being alive. Kind so those three things are clearly um Christian interpolations in the Josephus citation. I'm not aware of anyone who thinks that anything in Pliny is a Christian interpolation, at okay. least he takes that seriously. He's describing what churches are doing in the second century. Um, the allusion in Tacitus to the, um, to the um, fire of Rome being blamed on Christians, that's not a Christian interpolation by any right. means. And then he explains uh, where, where Jesus where Jesus's background is from. Mm -hmm. And then Suetonius talks about a Crestus, which isn't Christ, but most people say that that's a Christ, who's the origin of the Christian movement. So those are the four most common citations coming from the early second century and earlier. Um, and, uh, and they're good witnesses for a historical Jesus. Yeah, I mean, just given who they are, I mean, you have the broad spectrum, you have Gentiles, you have Jews, I mean, all talking about this Christ figure, this Jesus. Uh, and it sounds like from what you're uh, saying, uh, Dr. Bach, is that it they're, they're given a history on what was actually going on in this time. They're not trying to throw anything else into the mix like we see in these other Christian interpolations. They're just given a history of what's happening here. They're trying to explain where the Christians came from. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Dale. That, that's all I got right now. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, so 
Uh, just uh, so because of Tyler's question on the um, Alan Siegel, I just want to ask you a very specific question, and then we'll get back to the to the resurrection. But uh, Richard Bauckham's divine identity thesis—that's uh, something that I really think is a good way of understanding how the New Testament thinks of Jesus' divinity. But just wanted your thoughts on the divine identity thesis of, of Bauckham. Do you think that's a good way to understand yeah, it? Yeah, it is a very good way in. I mean, uh, the whole idea of how uh, monotheism came to be explained, and also the way in which certain texts present Jesus so that you can see this. So one of the things that you see is... Um, is the way in which, um, say, in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6, the Shema, the hero is through the Lord your God is one, is altered in such a way that both you have the pre pre presentation of the Father alongside the presentation of the Son, all wrapped up in the Shema. So taking this confessional element and, uh, uh, you know, there's one Father and there's one Lord. And, and the Father referring to God the Father, the Lord referring to Christ. And so um, tied to the creation, that, that Jesus is associated with the action of creating, which is a sign of monotheism. And uh, uh, how can I say that? A marker of monotheism. That, that Jesus is on, the way I like to say it is, Jesus ends up being on the creator side of the creator-creature divide. Um, that's that's a great way into thinking about the way in which uh, salvation works and the way in which Christology works. Awesome, awesome. All right, so I feel vindicated then. But uh, um, yeah, I just uh, so I want to turn to you. Uh, obviously, the the other most one of the most important doctrines of Christianity is Jesus's death and resurrection for our sins. So, uh, do you want to take some time to just outline what are the historical facts that we can prove related specifically to Jesus' death and resurrection then? Well, the main thing, of course, is, is that uh, we're very confident about the fact that he was crucified. I think we can be very, very confident he was crucified for claiming to be a messianic figure. The moment you put that messianic element in there, you've ruled out the idea of uh, seeing Jesus just as a prophetic figure, a religious great. Um, you've got the emphasis in all the early confessions about Jesus being at the right hand of God which uh, is a way of talking about resurrection and the result of resurrection, etc. So that's important. I like to joke that Jesus at his final trial when he talked about being at the right hand of God said, you may have me on trial here, but one day I'll be your judge and you can write me at www.righthandofgod.com. So, um, uh, so, you know, so you've, you've got that element of the equation. You've got the effect of the appearances. A very important part of this is is the Apostle Paul, how he went from Saul to Paul, living in Jerusalem as an opponent to Christianity um, and was convinced, was aware of what the Jewish position was, was convinced that Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, and then all of a sudden turned it around and turned it around on the basis of a, of, of a series of experiences of the risen Lord, all backed up against the timing and confession of the early church. The only way Paul or Saul comes there is if they were preaching a raised and exalted Jesus. Because that's he has to process the vision that he has. And he processes that theologically. And he processes it theologically as Jesus being a raised figure at the side of God. And he doesn't talk about the development of his theology when it comes to Christology. He saw the risen Lord and immediately understood who he was. He understood that because he had heard the preaching of the apostles, which he had previously re rejected, that now he saw was true. So you put that into the, you know, you sometimes get into discussion about the gap between the events of Jesus and the Gospels or the events of Jesus and the writing of the epistles of Paul. But that gap doesn't exist really for the events of Jesus and Paul's conversion. Gotcha. Yeah. Also, Ty, uh, Tyler, if you want to take over just for a little bit and yeah, do you have any questions or things you want to ask Daryl uh, about Jesus' resurrection? Obviously, this key doctrine. Uh, so I would like before, so before I get to the resurrection, we do have an audience question. Um, so Jamie is a, one of my favorite, uh, listeners. He, he's a good friend of mine and he brought this question up on a previous episode, uh, that we had talked about how, how do we understand the humanity and divinity of Jesus? And do you mind taking an audience question? Uh, real no, quick fine. Okay. Awesome. 
Uh, so Jamie asked, I'll put it up on the screen here. Uh, do you think that the mind of the Logos was fully present in Jesus? How should we think about his humanity and divinity? And then he adds to this. So this is the second part of his question. Where was the mind of the Logos while Jesus was four dividing cells in the womb of Mary? <laughs> uh I tell people that um, when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to have a press conference with God and we can <laughs> ask these kinds of questions and we yeah. probably won't care by the time the press conference comes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, taking it more seriously, you know, the, the confession of the church is, is that Jesus was fully human and fully di divine. So to the extent he has full human consciousness and he has uh, a divine power and authority, um, that's combined in his person. What we don't know, this is important to say, what we don't know is how he chose to utilize that structure of who he was. Okay. It's clear that in some cases he, um, I, I want to say, restricted or limited or, or did not draw on, on the access of, of all the elements and attributes that he had, and then there were times when he did draw on it. Sure. So, um, so to me, uh, you know, the, the four cell question relates to that's actually not an issue or a problem until we get to human consciousness um, and and think about it from that kind of way, because at the core of the question is really what's the relationship between the two? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jesus chose not to use all the capabilities that he had. I think the temptations, for example, show that. Um, yeah. So, so on the one hand, he's constituted this way, but what he's drawing upon as he lives his life is a different deal. So much so that he can be seen as an example of living as authentically human. Right on. I, uh, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. And so that, that's at least the, the angle I would take or the trajectory I would take in answering that question. No, I think you're right. I, and, and we have to keep in mind at the same time, you know, for our listeners sake that, First of all, you have this unique being, namely God, that totally no unique being. There's nothing, never been another human being like him, right? Nothing like him in creation, and then this unique being does another unique thing, namely incarnation. Right. And so, this is something that I, I, I just, I have to admit and be honest, I cannot grasp. I trust, I believe the Bible. Whenever we, whenever we read that God became man, I believe the testimony of the church fathers. Whenever they say that, you know. And do, can I understand it? Can I, or can I comprehend it? Yes. Can I understand it fully? Absolutely not. And so well, the dynamics be... are what we don't understand. We can understand the categories and the claim, right? But, we, but it's the dynamics that we wrestle with because, because um, what we don't know are, like I said, are the choices of limitation that he also undertook because Philippians three talks about his em emptying himself and taking on the form of a human being. So That's right. Was that he clearly has the authority of God and exercises that authority. He clearly has access to the power of God when he chooses to use it, that kind of thing. But um, but what that means across the board there, I mean, you know, it's the question the Muslims ask, you know, how can how can God die? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a good question. Um, and that's because of the way in which I mean, obviously he's alive. He's alive even he's alive even in his human death, okay, but he's but he's also really dead as a human and buried. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, that would be the way I would go at it. So that that's I thank you, floored Jamie. Actually, I know you did because he said that. So I'm floored. Thank you for the thoughtful uh, response. And so mm -hmm. we really appreciate that, uh, Doctor Bach. As far as the resurrection goes, I'm trying to think of something good, Dell, but I'm not coming up with anything, my friend. I'm okay. having a blank that's Tyler cool. moment. So no if you want to, I, I I see your back. Yeah, if you want to. Here's where I let me in. let me make this point about the resurrection. Okay. It's one that's often not made. Okay. And it's about Easter. You know, on Easter we go in and we and we and of course the pastor comes out at the beginning of Easter and he'll say to the crowd, "He is risen." Of course, mm. what does the crowd say back? He is risen indeed. He's risen indeed. So we make resurrection about the fact that there's life after death and Jesus is alive. Okay. There's actually more to it than that. It's actually God's vote in the dispute about what she put Jesus on the cross. There are two views about who Jesus is when he hangs on the cross. There's the Jewish leadership view and or the Roman view that says 
he either blasphemed or he claimed to be a king and he isn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one side. The other is, I am God's son and I am at the middle of God's kingdom. That's the other view. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to sort out that dispute? The resurrection is God's vote in that dispute. The resurrection is the vindication of Jesus' claims about himself. So not only is it that there's life after death and we're going to live with Jesus one day, but there's also the vindication of who Jesus is. And I think we under-preach that on Easter. And it's actually probably the most important point because the other point that we're making doesn't function without that point. Right. 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 So is that what Paul then means in Romans 1, I think it's verse 4, that he was declared son of God in power by the yeah, resurrection it, of the, the dead? La uh, literal language is he was horizoned as the oh, son wow. of God. Okay. In other words, he was marked out mm -hmm. as God. A horizon is a marker that tells you this is the end of the earth and this is the beginning of heaven. Right. All right. So he was horizoned as the son of God Wow. in power as a result of the resurrection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a few questions here. Definitely. Oh, were you done, Tyler? Or? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. All right, cool. So, so let me be a little bit of a smart aleck here and bring back in cultural apologetics to this question. Dale, you remember what happened last time you did that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. Uh, so let, let me. Up, how do we apply cultural apologetics to the evidence of the resurrection? Do you, Do you present the evidence mm. case for the resurrection? differently depending on who you're talking to um yeah what's your take on that well let me back up and take another take another step in this direction because all all apologetics as is all evangelism is creating categories that people currently don't have when you start that conversation and and this is what i mean the moment i walk into the room and present jesus as divinely divine and human simultaneously what i'm basically saying to a person and imagine particularly imagine a person who doesn't grow up in a Christian home, okay? Uh, or never, it's not, never darkened the door of a church. And you're sitting here saying, there is one human being in the existence of all human beings across all time who has been both human and divine, which is a nice way of saying this is a pretty unique category. <laughs> okay, just, I mean, just make yeah. the other, pretty unique category. All right, you're already climbing uphill. So how do you create that category for people? How do you get them to think about that, the category that's being? If, you, if you're dealing with someone who doesn't have association with the church, doesn't believe in God, you say God says, the Bible says, or you're made in the image of God, what have you communicated to them, given where they are? Good question. So all your engagement is designed to raise the possibility of thinking about creating categories that people currently don't possess. And so... So that's what you're in the business doing. You get that spiritual GPS reading on someone trying to figure out where exactly they're coming from to figure out what can I assume they already believe and what do they not believe and how do I think about having a conversation that might help them give them pause or help them to form a category they need in order to understand what I'm trying to say. Um, so that that's a part of the cultural apologetics approach. And so it really depends how you respond really depends on where that person is starting from, which is why initially in your conversations with people, I tell people we tend to go in, think we have an agenda. We need to, you know, dump what we know on them. No, the starting point is to actually sit down and do some pretty serious question asking and listening to find out where they are. And then you can know, kind of what approach may or may not be the best way in to have a conversation and to talk about the things that are a part of sharing the gospel. But your initial challenge, you know, I, I like to joke with this with the language for Mission Impossible, you know, um, uh, you know, know. This, your, your assignment, should you choose to accept is this, and this tape will not self-destruct in 10 seconds, uh -huh. you know, um, is um, is to engage in this category work um, and this relational category work that hopefully builds the bridges so that when you talk about God raising someone from the dead who happens to be human and divine, I mean, my goodness, how many hurdles are they having to get through to get to that sentence? Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Um, my, my next question, this might be something uh, uh, that you hinted at where you're talking about how it was a vindication 
of God. Um, so I, I kind of have, I think, look, if we can demonstrate on a balance of probabilities that Jesus did probably rise from the dead and, you know, therefore that attests, authenticates Christianity, I think that we can actually get two arguments for Christianity, not just one. So we have the, the event, the resurrection, but using Mike Lacona's, uh, you know, he has his six arguments that Jesus predicted in advance he would be vindicated by God or supernaturally. So this is kind of a, an extraordinary fulfillment of like a, a prophecy as well. Do you think that, um, so the, the way I phrased it in my previous blog, do you think that this is double warrant or am I as George? Well, said, what that, what thinking? the second argument does is it allows you to loop back to the value and, and credibility of the scripture. Okay. So what it allows you to do is to bring in, if I can say it this way, more resources into the conversation. Um, and that's very, very helpful. Gotcha. So, but you don't think we can use it as double warrant? like we? Well, you can, okay. but, but my point is the payoff is, the payoff of that is, is that now you're dealing with, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we think we can trust scriptures because it tells us this story and it's not doing it on refraction. It's doing it in anticipation. Awesome. All right, cool. And uh, last question, Tyler, I'll, I will give it to you for your questions next. Um, this is another one that you might not get all the time, but obviously um, you were uh, originally, I contacted you about a show on the Shroud of Turin. So do you want to just give your your general take, whether you're a, a skeptic? Yeah, I'm pretty, to be honest, I'm pretty skeptical about the Shroud of Turin. Uh, and uh, um, uh both the the origins of the material, um, the 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 nature of the how I say the nature of the of the marks on the shroud. I'm trying to figure out how to describe them. Um, that kind of thing. I'm just um, my understanding is is that uh, a lot of the evidence reflects um, a timing that's too late to be the shroud. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, uh, Tyler, over to you if you have any. Any other questions on the resurrection bit and stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to combine the resurrection with the culture apologetics and just ask Dr. Bach, is there any significant challenges that skeptics raise? So we've heard of the swoon theory. I don't buy the swoon theory for nothing. Um, but are there any significant challenges that skeptics raise uh, in regards to the resurrection of that? Are there any good arguments that, that these people bring Not about uh, to the, the table? Not about the fact or the emergence of the resurrection as something that happened and that the, and that the church taught. Okay. There are interesting questions tied to the way in which John tells the resurrection story versus the way the synoptics do and okay. the role of Mary in that, in, in, in those accounts. Okay. Because, uh, you know, Mary, uh, the initial testimony in John when they go back and talk to the disciples is they've taken the body and we don't know where it's been taken. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas the initial reporting in the synoptics is he's been raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. So you get the, you get the full, you get the, you get the conclusion, if you will. Right. Now, in my own mind, okay, and now I'm going to have a little fun. In my own mind, I think the women went back. They told their story of the empty tomb. And if you ever listen to a woman tell the story, she doesn't just tell the bottom line. She gives the background to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my own view is, is that she starts to tell the story about the tomb being empty and we didn't know where he had taken him. And she doesn't mention the angels start off until later on. John and Peter, that's all they need to hear. They're out the door um, looking to check and see what the women said. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, their testimony is continuing with the group. And so um, and, and so in my mind, what John is doing in his story is he's telling how he found out about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And he found out by the resurrection, first hearing Mary's report and then running to the tomb to check it out. And then he goes back and tells the story of Jesus appearance to Mary. OK, right. while she's uncertain about what's going on, et cetera. Um, and so it's a reloop and it's not necessarily in the chronological order in which it happened, which is the yeah. curveball and the way I read John. But, um, uh, and so that's a way to explain that. But I do think there are legitimate questions about the sequencing and the synoptic relationship uh, of the, the way the synoptics tell the story versus John. I think that's the most challenging part 
of of what people write about the resurrection accounts. In dealing with John, can we appeal to the rest of the Gospel of John instead of the last chapter and show that John obviously doesn't write his gospel in chronological order? It seems like he skips parts and then goes back to them in a, in a sense. Would could that be he, a way to— I mean, you, okay. could, you could make that argument. He certainly has things that the synoptics don't have. About 88% of John is not in the synoptics. Right. So it seems clear that John is designing— to supplement what we know and what was already in. There's a huge debate about whether John knows the synoptics or not. Okay. I say, don't get lost in that conversation. If he doesn't know the synoptics, he certainly knows the tradition which produced the synoptics. Sure. So, um, so, uh, so there's that element of the equation. You have, you have the very unusual placement of the cleansing of the temple in John vis-a-vis mm -hmm. the synoptics. There's a huge debate about whether there were two cleansings, which I tend to think is unlikely, mm -hmm. uh, or who, and then if there's only one, who moved it? It's more likely to be John than it is the synoptics. Uh, there are people who think otherwise, but that would be the way I would put that together. And that would be evidence for not doing things in a chronological order. Okay. All right. Um, so one last question that I've got then. Whenever, so going back to the culture apologetics aspect of this conversation, when er, do you start in... in yeah. Do you start your conversation with somebody uh, about the resurrection? Like, is that the starting point or do you kind of build up to it? And if you once you get to the resurrection, where do you go after that? Or is that kind of where you leave people to? Yeah, I don't have a rule. About, um, okay. I don't have a rule about how I pursue these conversations. I'm responding to where the other person's coming from. OK, what they're curious about pursuing, where their questions are, et cetera. So, so I don't, I don't have a rule about how to do that. I'm more interested initially in just what their impressions of Christianity are and what their impressions of Jesus are. And particularly if they think he is just a religious guide or like a great prophetic figure, mm -hmm. my first assignment is disown them of that even being a possibility. Okay. Not that he isn't a prophetic like figure, but yeah. that that doesn't do enough to right. explain who he is. And so, so, um, so it really depends. I, I, I tell people, I don't, I don't go in with a template. I go in, I go in with this, this array of stuff that I know about Jesus, uh, uh, to have access to, and then I'll play the card that needs to be played depending on where the conversation is, but I'm letting the other person to some degree, um, open up open up the conversation and, and take it in whatever direction they're interested in going. That's part of being a good listener, you know, mm -hmm. is, is not, I don't, I don't want to communicate an agenda to them. I want to communicate. I'm relating to you and, and I'm in related to your interests or curiosities or whatever it is you have about, um, about, uh, Christianity. So it's very much a case by case. Exactly. Okay. Right on. Dale? All right, cool. Um, hopefully, I, I know uh, we've got you for an hour kind of thing, but do you mind if I ask one last question? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Okay, cool. So, um, so I'm very interested in terms of the ex explanations for the individual appearances or f individual facts relevant to the resurrection. Um, I remember for, for years, me and Gary were going back and forth about you know, do, do you think that you can prove that there's a miracle or not, again, not prove, but on a balance of probabilities, do you think you can argue for a miracle or that God is authenticating Christianity based on the individual isolated facts? Or is it only a cumulative case that you think you can establish? Well, I think it, I, I'll say it this way. I don't, I'm, I think I, obviously with Paul, OK, that's an important individualized appearance that is significant and I think is, for lack of a better, self-authenticating in some ways. I mean, he he tells you what changed him, et cetera. And you either got to believe that that Paul had a real experience of some kind or he else he was deluded. I mean, those are the only, those are your only two options. Mm -hmm. um, he certainly didn't make it up. OK, so so that doesn't seem to be the option. Uh, but I think the backside of it is, is that the more the merrier. I mean, um, it is the array accumulation. You know, one of the ones that people always talk about is the 500 at once. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is kind of like mega bingo. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, uh, it, it's just, you know, that one, that one 
gets behind the uh, psychological, how is the psychologically induced experience people create or the what uh, the hysteria. conceptual s- suggestive situation. That's something that's much more uh, m- much more of a challenge to just dismiss. So of the ones that we hear about, that one is in many ways uh, among the more interesting ones. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, yeah, just want to say thank you so much. Um, we, we are at the hour mark and stuff. I, I hope you enjoyed enjoyed your time on your no, end. Absolutely. Awesome. So yeah, I'll let you have a closing word. If you if you want to plug anything, if you got a website or YouTube or any books, anything you want to do. So uh, I'll just drive people to our website at this at in Dallas at the center. Uh, voice.dts.edu hit podcast and you'll get the table podcast welcome to the table we discuss issues of god and culture which is a nice way of saying we discuss anything and everything and that there's over 600 hours of material i think we've got uh, like 500 episodes or something like that covering just about the full array of the types of things that people are asking about that kind of thing we've been doing it for 12 years now and uh and that that would be the the one site. So voice.dts.edu slash table podcast will also get you there. So um, that'll get you more directly to the podcast site. But either way, you can you can get to the site and uh, you can sign up to be what's called a Hendrick Center Insider, and uh, and that way those podcasts will come to you every Tuesday automatically. Awesome. Awesome. I will always, I'll, I'll just say this real quick. I've all, I will always have a soft spot for Dallas in my heart. It was actually, so a buddy of mine gave me a whole bunch of S Lewis Johnson tapes, whole bunch of them. And that's ended up what led me to the Lord uh, was just listening to him sermon after sermon. And, and so I'll always have a spot for believers uh, chapel and Dallas theological. Center. Well, you were offered them. those tapes from before the foundation of the world. That's how S. Lewis Johnson would say it. So you'll understand what I'm saying to you. Exactly. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Bach. It was an amazing experience. So thank you for coming on. It was a pleasure to meet you. Um, Dale, you can take us out if you want to, brother. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I share your sentiments. I, yeah, thank you so much. It's been great, great talking to you and, and getting bouncing ideas off you and getting your uh, your take on this stuff. So yeah, David I think- missed out. David did miss out. He's going <laughs> himself. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think so tomorrow night, uh, that's actually your deal, Tyler. So what, why don't you tell the audience, what do we have coming up tomorrow night for our show? So we will be talking about the role of music in the church, a history about music. So a split that happened uh, not too long ago, actually, uh, within church history, uh, whenever it comes to the Church of Christ. So we're going to uh, be talking about them. Uh, acapella versus instrumental uses in worship and just a big conversation. So Clinton Wilcox is join, uh, going to be joining us uh, for that conversation. And I'm just excited to uh, to talk about some music, being a, a music guy myself. I love music and it's uh, definitely interesting uh, hearing the Church of Christ position uh, whenever it comes to no instruments at all. Uh, within worship because that's all i grew up with right is instruments in church and so that's going to be a really exciting that starts tomorrow 7 p.m eastern time if y'all want to check it out we'll be there awesome all right well have a have a great week everybody